look at politicians are not always celebrated for what can be done. And what this what this film shows is that things are possible. And for that reason, I think it's inspiring, uh, and it's a, an especially appropriate venue uh, in which to be talking about it tonight. Uh, so, uh, for those of you who I didn't uh, see at the outset, I'm Evan Ostos from the New Yorker and the Berkman's Institution. It's a real pleasure to be here, a, a thrill to be here with my friend Don Sinclair Shapiro, the filmmaker, and of course Senator Tillis, who was so instrumental in getting this uh, getting this issue into the political arena where it needed to be. So what we're going to do tonight is we're going to talk just for a few minutes and then we'll open it up for questions eventually. Um, we're going to talk about the film, about some of the choices that went into how this was made and the issues it raises. And then we're also going to talk, of course, about the process of how you actually manage to get this thing done. A little bit of legislative jujitsu. And maybe we'll hear some tips on what actually went into More of a Jedi mind for us. Jedi mind for <laughs> All right, good. I'm glad we defined our terms at the outset. But I would, if I could, Senator, uh, given you know, we are here in your, uh, we're here in your neck of the woods, and I wondered if you would set the context for us, in the sense that it would be easy for some people to look at this film and say, well, you know, that's interesting, it's a bit of history, um, I'm not from North Carolina, maybe it doesn't have anything to do with me, maybe I'm not from one of the states where this matters. But I get the sense that you regard this as a sort of, a, a fiercely contemporary issue, that all the things that were raised in here about, about justice and about uh, the role of government and about the sort of sanctity of citizenship um, feel contemporary. But I wonder if you would tell us why it is that this, why did this issue resonate with you and, and what do you hope people take away from this film? You know, I'm sure that a lot of people try to analyze what my motivations were because I was Catholic, that I did it, you know, because of my Catholic beliefs or, or whatever. Um, really what was front and center in this was identifying and recording for posterity um, the extremes that government can go to um, control the individual's life. I mean, if you think about it, it can happen now. That's why I say, I, I forgot that I said it in the, uh, in the film, but that's why I said we always have to be mindful that these horrible things can happen, that we're somehow better and that the city state cannot make similar mistakes again. Is wrong. Back when this whole concept of eugenics was being talked about, it was, you know, the, the criminal or criminal society were the ones who thought this was a righteous and good thing. So, what makes someone think that something equally as bad couldn't happen today? Um, so, to me, it was really to memorialize that and to hold the state accountable for its role in this tra tragic episode in North Carolina and, and many other states and counties across the nation. So in a sense, it was also not only about the power of government, but also uh, the responsibility to hold it in check when necessary. Uh, this resonated with me. That's exactly it. was also, and this was the most difficult thing, I think, for many of our members to get their, their arms around. And it was, we as a, we're a living body, the legislature is a living body, um, that the, the gentleman in one of the town halls had said, it wasn't my fault I didn't do it. That's not enough. You, you, you exist in a country that has institutions that carry on, and we are responsible for the bad actions. We personally are not, but as stewards of the institution we are, and I thought it was very important for us to, to live up to uh, recognizing the, you know, the horrible outcome of eugenics. And for people who may not know if they're not from North Carolina, and we'll get to Donna just a second, but how well known was this issue? I mean, was this the kind of thing that every school child knew about? The first time, and that's why I think Larry Wombo and I became fast friends, I had never heard of it. I moved to North Carolina in 1998, so I uh, I wasn't born and raised in North Carolina, but I'd never heard of it. And uh, Representative Wombo was doing an information session on this program called Eugenics. I just saw it. So I catch so At the time, going to it, I didn't even know what Eugenics was. But Larry was a nice guy. We disagreed on virtually everything. But I liked him, and he was having something off campus. and. He asked me if I would come and I did. That, that was really what my eyes were first open. It's the first two years in the legislature. And we're going to hear more about how it is that you managed to figure out ways to, to get this through. Don, as you just heard, the senator said he was in North Carolina and this was news to him. So even though this was in 33 states, these kinds of sterilization programs, how is it that you came upon this story and realized that there may be a film there that would have this broader reach and resonance? 
for that words you often hear in our but anyway, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, because you needed to absorb it. It's kind of what Johanna says in the film is that these voices were speaking to her for some kind of acknowledgement beyond an academic paper or even book. And by reading those um, eugenic board summaries, which were only a paragraph, I only saw actual paperwork for survivors when I went into their homes and we asked them to read, to give them a form of agency. And those were more dossiers. Those were not what the eugenics board saw. They had a paragraph summary. I mean, Dorothy Bates' paperwork was like 30 pages long. They had a family pedigree chart. Their goal was to sterilize her entire family in terms of aunts, uncles, cousins, everybody. They, it was systematic and it, it definitely, it, it had um, a sinister bent. But to your point, you were, they were looking at extreme poverty. They were looking at a time, obviously before the early 60s, when there was no reliable contraception available. So women who needed to control their childbearing and had sometimes a dozen, eight and 12 children this was a service, and you would go through the formalities of the eugenics board. And the epidemiologists and medical historians estimate about 5 to 10% of the 7,600 cases are possibly that. Um, but that I do believe that the rubber stamping that happened in Raleigh on a monthly basis is kind of that banality, if you will, of bureaucracy. But that they were, in many ways, I think, thinking that, that they were doing good that eugenic science had been disproven, but that they were helping either, not just, um, by the time it got to the eugenics board, I think in the 60s and 70s, clearly it's a racial bent. And I think that's different than what we saw in the first 30, 25 years, which was more like this is going to be a, a magic bullet to poverty. So, Senator, when this started coming across your radar screen, I mean, this issue had gone nowhere, and then all of a sudden you and Larry Wong will sort of fashion this it was an unusual partnership in a sense, right? So can you tell us the story of how that happened? How did you guys first really sort of have a meeting of the minds on this issue? And where did you begin to chart the course of how you were going to get this? Well, after the uh, the first briefing that he invited me to back when I was a freshman, I said, Larry, you know, I'm, I'm a Wikipedia reference for irrelevant. I'm a Republican freshman, I'm a perpetual minority, but if there's any way I can help you, I will. We maintain contact, and I saw him. Um, for four years, just failed to get even a hearing uh, on eugenics on the, uh, under the then Democratic leadership. So when I became speaker, I said, now's the time for us to start working on it. You can I ask you one question? Why do you think why do you think couldn't get a hearing? Well, because you, you can you can see in the film that people from either end of the spectrum will either say it's not the appropriate role of government to but to the gentleman's comments in the town right. hall, uh, or it wasn't my fault, it was somebody else's fault. Or the other end of the spectrum, there are people who would like to use it as a vehicle for advancing an agenda item that they just want to relate tangentially. So sometimes I really question their sincerity about whether they want to get it done. At the end, then you knew that the pushback from that side was going to be, it's like up here. It's the, I'm against it because you didn't go far enough, and the other end, I'm against it because you shouldn't be going at all. And I told Larry, just, you know, Papa Lynn and be Ray. Um, I knew that I would have challenges with my, uh, uh, with my members. I knew that I had to deal with the Senate, but I thought if we were strategic and patient, we'd get it done. So it was, uh, it, I had no idea the, uh, the, the twist and turns that we would have to take to finally get it done. But I intuitively knew it was going to be difficult and understood why the other leadership, they, they just simply weren't willing to take a chance. And they weren't willing to take a chance because they were afraid of what their constituency was going to say about them. Yeah. Uh, they were going to have to turn to people who would otherwise be their friends and say, hold off, we're going to get this done. We're not going to take a step too far. And make some hard decisions. I mean, sitting in those drafting sessions, you guys had to make some hard decisions. The, the living threshold, the number, and I think because this was seen only through the social justice lens for so long, you couldn't please everyone from that spectrum. And so I think for you, it was, you tell me, the tension in the, for the tension in the film is in the Republican caucus, but when we kind of hit the arc of the film. And I found that way more interesting, obviously. Yeah. Well, you know, there was that challenge. But, but all these things were things that, that, that were risks that could be bounded. You just had to think it through. That's what we did. We, created an adjudication process now that I'm trying to get counties to follow so that they follow suit on restitution for sterilizations that they ordered. 
but you know, it was just it was really just classic blocking and tackling. I'd like to say that I envisioned from the first day exactly how we were going to get it done, but it was more like an episode of Walking Dead. Every time you thought you'd gotten that last zombie, another one would pop out of the closet, and you'd have to go beat it back to get it done. So, a useful analogy, by the way, <laughs> for the given moment. And I do think, um, you mentioned earlier, you know, where we are. Uh, how much of the, of the tools that worked in North Carolina work for you here versus how many of the, how much is the dynamic different here in camp? It's no different. Um, you think about it, if we have 100 members up here, they're all human beings. They have all things that maybe force them to associate with an ideology. Um, but I do believe that uh, there's a way to, to approach this from the perspective of their constituents and from their conscience. You know, I, for one, uh, what Don knows the three C's, I, for one, consider the conference that I'm associated with the last factor in me making a decision on how I go. I think it's a matter of going out and building relationships and finding areas to work together. And one of the things you identified that was interesting was that the resistance that uh, the Senator ran into in North Carolina, even centered on things like the language, the words that people use. Yeah. What was that about? So I, I kind of say it does come down to semantics because there was a lot of guidance uh, once we hit 2013 to really stay away from the word reparations and to focus on compensation. And this idea that um, the living survivor threshold and compensation can, um, and Mary Ziegler says this, not directly in the film, but that helped conservatives who were afraid there was this backdoor to reparations by passing a statute. Um, and, but what's interesting is it was Senator Floyd McKissick, who, the head of the Black Caucus, who brings that up, not only me, but I saw him educating members. And so it would, and if you're um, Irene Clark at the end, who is sort of our history detective, um, she has also articulated that um, in her own way, being a black woman who grew up uh, in the Jim Crow South, is one of the first genetic professors to teach at a full four-year university, and came across eugenics in this story to herself where we say, this happened here, I can't preach that. I taught, I taught genetics for 35 years. I didn't know that this was, I knew what eugenics was, but I had no idea it manifested this way in my own state. So I think um, this idea of how we figured, you know, watching what happened in the General Assembly was how did they help kind of educate members on the one hand, and understanding that legislators are voting on a lot of legislation, and you have to have someone or two politicians who are really going at um, this with a passionate desire to educate their colleagues. Um, and then you have to explain that, no, this isn't reparations, this is compensation. And um, not that that was a deal break, or not that that was what coasted through, but I did notice things started moving. There was getting more communication after those education sessions, if you will, were happening where that was. Yeah, I think the other thing, because it's a great image in the, uh, in the, in the documentary that, to give you an idea of the, the context within which we were doing all this, there were hundreds of people coming to the legislature every Monday night protesting mm -hmm. uh, for any number of things. So we, I, I, over the course of the time, this is really an interest that I hadn't thought about, but over the course of the time, in the, uh, the last two years that I was speaker, I probably had to order the arrest of some 400 people for disrupting our chambers. That's got to feel a little bit good, I think. Well, um, <laughs> some more than others. <laughs> but, but so uh, you're managing that, and then you've got uh, this you know, raucous group of people within the chamber going, why are we doing all this when we're getting all of these other um, pushbacks of all things we're right. trying to do? And um, so it made it, I think, all the more interesting that we could keep the members focused and ultimately convince the Senate to work with us to get the, pass, the, the bill passed. It doesn't get done without the Senate ultimately coming through. We mentioned earlier the idea of you know, conscience and then conference eventually is last. We are obviously living in a moment now where it can so often feel as if conference comes first and it seems almost impossible to try to get something accomplished to try to cut through the sort of political tribalism that is so dominant at the moment in Washington. What, what lessons did you learn as a result of this process that were, were takeaways that you think might be relevant to people as you try to adapt that to our predicament that we are in? I think it's, it's you know, it gets back to uh, there are no superhumans in the Congress that may come as a shock to you, but uh, uh, they're just men and women, most of them with admirable uh, aspirations, uh, very different 
the choices in terms of the means to the ends. You just got to start talking with people. And you got to pick the things you're simply not going to be able to move forward with. I don't want to have a discussion about 80% of the things that uh, Al Franken uh, Al Franken won't want to get done because they're on my I don't want to get it done list. Mm -hmm. But when you sit down and you talk with Al Franken about uh, criminal justice reform uh, or working more on policies that bring people to the center on heroin addiction and strategies to deal with it, that's how you get it done. It's got to be transactional. There's not got to be this sea change of, oh, we all just want to be friends now. That's not how this political process works. It never has. I think it's more a matter of finding these transactions like eugenics, mm -hmm. where in that particular case, I had a coalition that had a greater number of people who ideologically didn't like me working together on this one thing because I think their conscience drove them to it, and, and a fair number of Republicans in the end. So we may get uh, more fights about the United States state legislatures around the country. John, what, what's, what's coming up next? What's the next place that you think this is going to become an issue? Uh, and what should we be looking for over the horizon as far as the future of uh, legislation on that? I think when I've spoken with the senator in his office, uh, California is sort of, you know, a natural call to action, if you will, to get educated on this issue. Um, we know now, since December, a professor at the University of Michigan, Alexandra Stern, um, has a trove of archive with UC Johanna from not the same eugenics board, but eugenic files of people who were sterilized in the same manner under a very similar statute. Her, files with the uh, early 50s, and their epidemiologists estimated um, upwards of 800 living in these files. And I know you can talk a little bit about some of the groundwork you're trying to lay here with your colleagues in the Senate in California. I've, uh, I've met with uh, Senator Feinstein and uh, the incoming uh, freshman Senator Harris. I actually had a chance meeting with the LA County Supervisor last week. Uh, that uh, They came in and talked about one thing. I ended up hijacking the end of the conversation and talked one thing that uh, the, the, the people have to decide why they're in this. Are they in this because they like to watch themselves on TV? Or are they in it to try and figure out how you unwind this in the way that it was implemented in your state? Mm -hmm. So one concern that I have, and I'm, not, I'm just not saying California, but any state, understand how the program was implemented and the wrongs that were done before you start designing a solution to right those wrongs to the extent <laughs> restitution is, because in, in California, structurally, it was executed in a very different way. And uh, it is probably less likely that the state should uh, should bear the, uh, the majority of the burden, or maybe in equal proportion to the counties. Mm -hmm. So they need to work through all that. They need to work through the math. They need to uh, get people in a room and make sure that people, California is kind of known for its activism. Mm -hmm. One concern that I have with California is someone hijacking this for something that has maybe in part something to do with the right thing for eugenics victims, but in large part for some other um, priority that they may have and use it for its emotional appeal and its platform. So I think that would be despicable, mm -hmm. uh, but I do think that there's a risk, and, and I'm not saying in California that could happen anywhere for the camera, the camera hounds and the activists in the world. So what kind of broader conversation do you hope the film generates? What are the issues that you think it brings up that you want people to be talking about? I think there's a couple of entry points. Uh, the journalism appeals to me coming from that background, and we kind of showcase, kind of spot the first 20 minutes of the film. Um, and that is definitely we've already got stakeholders in the journalism school departments and uh, kind of wanting to you know bolster up the fourth estate. We need a fourth estate, we need five or fourth estate. And this is the perfect example of local, regional, you know, just like boots on the ground, investigative journalism. It couldn't, you couldn't get to where we're sitting here now because without that journalism, taking those primary sources of Johanna Schoen, connecting them with the living survivors, doing the entire background, fleshing out the story in five parts, you just, there was nothing very long we would have had to run with. Um, so that's one entry point. The medical ethics, uh, we already have a lot of requests and done some screenings with medical ethics. Um, in terms of how sterilization and contraception, it falls in, it's part of the contraception spectrum today. So how do you teach this history and uh, opening this up? I mean, I, I'm sure you didn't know when we got started that you'd be in a film with Gloria Stein, nor she, you. Uh, it occurred to me in the back of the room, or 
This could be the beginning of a glorious partnership. You know, the two of you probably take on the road. It's probably going to be a primary ad against me in 2020. But you both say, I mean, you have different world views, but she says to me things like, you know, the, the, the government's control of our body should stop at our skin. You say this is an egregious overreach of government. I mean, very similar sentiments. Again, different world views. I would never, um, but we needed, right? Cal Perry, when he has accident, I needed to bring in these, uh, these other perspectives. And um, the goal is to look at this issue in a reproductive rights spectrum, absolutely. And having holistic conversations um, about reproductive rights and reproductive health. Um, and that is why this issue does not fit squarely in this pro-life, pro-choice, because it's the right to procreate. And there's battle lines have been set up about the right not to procreate. And these rights go both ways. This is a spectrum. And um, I think there's there's a lot of opportunity to kind of, and the, again, people have a lot of similar feelings and thoughts. They get out of their comfort zone and they watch this film and I've had more people come up to me at screenings over the past few weeks um, who say, I have a more conservative approach to reproductive rights. And now after watching this, I really want to, when can I see it again? When can I show it to my class? When can I show it to my family? I want to talk about what a reproductive right is in a different way. It's like, great, I'm not, I'm not here to drink, make someone drink someone else's Kool-Aid at all. And I've been asked questions on the record, and I don't know if it's hit the press, but they've asked me, why didn't you hold Till us accountable for all of his pro-life stances? I'm like, I didn't go in with access to make a film about uh, abortion and contraception. My access is on the issue of um, compensation and will it get done. And I think that I had to kind of stick to my guns and I've been, you know, happy to talk about, but you have to do it in a more holistic way where we all have, we're working with the same facts. Um, and so I do stand by my decisions in both my edit and the direction that I took, but I do think that you can watch this film and have um, constructive conversations. We're going to turn to the audience in a minute uh, to, for your question, but before we do, I, just, I wonder if I could follow up with you, Senator, on that question. It's an interesting one, which is, as you said, you know, you, you always try to vote with your conscience first, so you've got two issues here, both about the government, sort of the role of government and the body. Did you ever feel any sort of contradiction? You've been a principal pro-life legislator, uh, and you are you're an opponent of abortion, but at the same time, you also believe firmly in the idea that the government uh, overreached when it was involved in these sterilization. How do you put these two things side by side? And, and do you see, did it feel like any kind of contradiction to you? No, I actually, I don't think so. It really um, never occurred to me that I had to consider the two as being related. I saw one as a, a horrible program perpetrated by the government, a government taking. So forget the nature of the taking, just a government taking, a, you know, arguably the most profound form. I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of these things never get solved. Because you try to reconcile with so many other things that you're struggling with that you lack the, that that people lack the discipline to say, I'm gonna block out the other things that could distract me and make me guilty of the decade of leaders who came before me and not solve that problem. Mm -hmm. That problem solved. Mm -hmm. Did it materially change my position on life? No. Did it materially change the lawyer's position on life? No. Those are battles that, and discussions and dialogue that we can have on that issue now that at least in North Carolina, we put this one to rest. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we've got it documented beautifully. I think we're all we're, we're, we're better off for it. Um, if folks have questions, I think we've got uh, a microphone or two set up here on the side. If you have something that you'd like to ask, we can probably well, I might think about it, if at all, uh, I think Donna does make a great point that this, the, this documentary, not the process that I went through to solve this problem, but this documentary does provide a great, I would love at some point to have that discussion um, uh, to answer that question, because this is just one data point you would use to, to have that discussion. But if I'd allow that to enter into the discussion, I'm pretty certain that I would have blown up the coalitions that ultimately came together to do the right thing. You can't get too many agendas, to yeah. your point. No, and you, I, could, I could see that that um, was rising and surfacing all the time because I was getting asked the questions as well. Either end. Uh, and, either and I understood, end. yeah. 
Sounds like next time we're going to have Gloria Steinem up here with us. <laughs> uh, this gentleman. Hi, good evening. I'm Pat Butler. I'm the president of America's Public Television Station, and I wanted to congratulate you on your uh, fine work and Brian Sikora from UNC TV. And uh, this is the kind of work that we, that we try to do in public television, and I'm very proud of this evening. Senator Tillis, I came to Washington a long time ago with Senator Howard Baker of Tennessee and worked for President Ford and President Reagan. And I find it refreshing that there's somebody like you on this stage here who believes in, in uh, conscience and, uh, and constituency and caucus in, in that order. I wonder after two years in the Senate, if you find yourself a little exceptional or more, or, or that, you're, that you feel that more of your, of your fellow senators are in the same uh, both that you're in with respect to your philosophy of politics, and secondly, uh, how can citizens like us uh, encourage and enable people like you to, to serve in public office? Well, uh, thank you for the question. I, you know, I, I think proportionately speaking, um, probably no more or no fewer members here in the Senate than I found back in the House, the conference, or the caucus that I was responsible for. The way you get people to really think through what I call the three C's are not in these high-minded, uh, you know, broader philosophical discussions. It's in the context of this piece of paper I'm laying on someone's table and asking them how they're going to vote. And I ask them if they don't have an answer, go through this process. Explain to me how your conscience would lead you to whatever decision you want to make. Just give me your, give me your best view. If not, then what do you think your constituents, the people who voted for you, would want you to do on this specific matter? And then finally, if those aren't in play, then, you know, in the interest of wearing the jersey of a red jersey or a blue jersey, then vote with your team. But you can't do that. It, it, would, it would be a complete waste of time to do that as, a, a, as just a general concept because you'd always be dealing with the exceptions. It's best to do it when you're looking at a specific problem that needs to be solved and setting the parameters for how you go about solving that problem. Um, I think all you need to do is just get people that will open up their minds. You know, not what, what we need more of in Washington are people who truly understand what political courage is. Political courage is not me going to Gloria and crossing swords on an issue that we are clearly in different uh, uh, positions. Political courage is when I go to a colleague who also identifies himself as a conservative and explain why I am not with them on any given issue that comes before this body. That's really what's missing here and it's become less so because of the media cycles and the star power with all due respect to some, not all media. They like to make a star out of the most uh, polarizing figures up here. And they happen to be people who will threaten to go back into the states for people who would otherwise like to work with you and say, if you do that, then the consequence will be your lost primary. Um, so you're going to lose that on a broader basis. Uh, at that transactional level, though, I do think there's a lot of opportunities for us to do much better than we've done in decades. Thank you very much. And if I can make oh, please, please do. Yes, public television, you know, uh, horn here. This film had a lot of um, homies offered to it, right? When I sent it out, and, um, I was surprised, but grateful. And it is Rachel and Amy who are here with us tonight who sold me on bringing it to public television because they were willing. Also, their South Carolina, North Carolina um, citizens who knew the story inside and out from one part, and were fascinated by the tale. Um, but we're really dedicated about bringing the story to communities around the country, and they have, and it's, they understand the film and the story in the area in a way that it, the, the larger um, cable and broadcast opportunities for this film, um, it would have been a great kind of thing to hang your professional hat on, but five years on this, um, the people I've met, the journey we've all done, you never saw a cut of the film until our last interview. He didn't know what I was doing. And um, I, so I, I thank you, I said thank you to everyone on, you know, this tour over the last few weeks to, to discuss Common Ground, um, but everyone from the journalists to the survivors to the politicians um, who never got to see anything until they sat in the screen or had uh, the film sent to them when it was done, um, they really stuck with it. But it was really, you know, 
making it is half a battle and getting it out to people, and that's public TV, and I can't thank you enough um, for supporting this. Great. Thank yeah, you. by the way, I'm a big supporter. I uh, sometimes got criticized when I was Speaker of the House for trying to, to support national public, uh, actually all kinds of public uh, broadcasting, radio in uh, North Carolina. Yeah, you, you provide a, a great service. And, I appreciate it. Incidentally, the only request I made of Don is that none of this ever became public until after my election. That's and 2012. We only had an embargo. <laughs> <laughs> I was not in C2014. And that was because the last thing we wanted to have happen is have this make it look like it was some sort of a, a tool for my political aspirations. Honestly, when this whole process started, I was already circulating a resume to go back into the private sector. I had not. Uh, decided that I was going to run for the Senate. Well, I, I mean, this is a, a relevant question for people in this room who are trying to decide whether you cooperate with a filmmaker or whether you cooperate with somebody who's trying to do this sort of project. How do you make that choice? I mean, that's a, it's a risk, actually, to let somebody in and, you know, follow your deliberations. Why do you decide to do it? <laughs> uh, uh, my comp staff, one of my comp staff sitting up here on the front row, they know that I have probably a pretty, uh, uh, liberal view of, for, I, I just don't, I'm, I'm not here to uh, worry too much about how people perceive me. I have been, I was in the most expensive, I think that in the, the thesis said I was in the most expensive race in U.S. history. I saw $80 million spent against me to destroy my reputation. So really, I mean, how many other productions are going to potentially spend that much to destroy my reputation? And, and we did okay. So let them come in and form their own opinions. But I think it's to, this idea of more solution-based journalism. Yeah. Obviously, yeah. this is a kind of slow solution-based, and it's not running down and gotcha. And that's partly why I'm working in this space, is I don't have to be out in front of the story anymore like I used to. That, that was a great job in broadcast news for years. But that's part of doing this work. And I think we need to try. And I guess it's important. One of the journalists at the time said, this is like embedding. You kind of embed it. Because, and how did you keep your journalistic hat on? And how did you not information share? I said, well, you know, you, you do what you would do, even though you were only maybe in something for a day. And I was in it for years with these people that I formed relationships um, and a bond of trust. And I think you need that. Um, I think there's too many examples for politicians to bring in journalists. And then they, you know, when you have, especially if you have a boot mic, we're recording all the time. People say crazy things. And um, we're not interested in taking that and using it. Yeah. And, and it's usually, you know, if, if we notice you're on the phone, if you have a lob on, you're on the phone with your wife, you're like, oh, kill that, you know, because like, sometimes the sound guy, you would just keep the mic on you because you knew you were going to be filming again, but you needed time to do some personal work, and then you were going. Um, and I had the headset on, and uh, I was sitting out there, as you know, I just would sit up there all the time. And in a little hallway outside her office, and... So what you're saying is you're compromising the chair. <laughs> <laughs> it's like we'll plans for our private Yeah, But, you know, I mean, that's about as, as personal, but you can see how, again, I think it's, you want to be prudent, but I think we need a little bit more um, access for journalists to get inside, but first, there needs to be more trust, and the, the idea of, like, the media's bad and politicians are evil, um, finding journalists to partner with, and I think um, take away a little bit of the, the, the veil of secrecy. Um, and again, you need your privacy, and there needs to be, uh, you know, we're not, it's not even about transparency. Uh, no, it is about demystifying the process. Demystifying the process. I did think uh, that very quickly they demonstrated an interest in things that most people walking down the hallway with a microphone were not interested in. They were interested in the mechanics and so many things that I think are lost on a lot of people who are just trying to get a blog or a, a, a quick, uh, something quick to print. So it, it became very obvious to me. That's why I never really uh, thought to ask about how the production was going or where the content was going. Honestly, until I viewed it for the first time uh, a couple of months ago when you sent me a link, um, I had no earthly idea what to expect. Right. Well, it's it's rare to see actually a narrative about cooperation and consensus rather than a narrative about conflict. And I think that's one of the reasons why this project will endure. I think we are out of time, and uh, I want to thank all of you folks for coming tonight. And I also want to thank, of course, uh, Don and the Senator for this conversation. I hope you'll join me in a round of applause. And another section. Please stay for your session. Thank you.